an artificial voice the artists created. A texture of imagined grass. agitated network of impossibilities. Can we fix this? A horizon of agitated parallel lines. Circles within circles to the left. Images constantly transforming. Everything takes the time it needs. they disappear. Scribble. possible ecology. Dissolving tangles. they disappear. I am still an artificial voice the artists created. appear and look at us they disappear. Scribble. Well, wow, well, wow, that was uh, wonderful. So 
Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our event uh, this evening. Uh, my name's uh, Tim Miller. I'm a professor of computer science here at the University of Melbourne. Um, and along with Professor Jeannie Patterson, I'm one of the co-directors for the Centre for AI and Digital Ethics, or CAID as we call it, uh, who's hosting this event um, tonight. Um, so I'll just start off um, with a traditional acknowledgement of country. So the land that I'm on uh, right now in my house is uh, belongs to the Wurundjeri people, and it's also the land where the University of Melbourne Parkville campus is. Uh, and the Wurundjeri were, uh, or, uh, are, that live on the land here around the Birrarung, otherwise known as the Yarra uh, River, uh, and their land stretches um, quite far in the north up to towards Mount Disappointment and all the way to Healesville in the east. Um, I think Mor Mordialak is probably about as far south as it goes, around about 10,000 square kilometres around this uh, area. And at the University of Melbourne, we like to acknowledge that this is and always has been and always will be their land. Uh, thanks very much to our uh, artists, you saw their, their wonderful digital performance here this, uh, this evening, um, Madeline Flynn and Tim Humphrey. And so their uh, performance here is called There Is No Point of No Return. And that piece of art asks us to consider our, our sort of our two bodies, the, the sort of standard typical physical body that we would think that interacts with our environment every day, but also our body that's part of a, a larger global network and ask us to consider the effect that that, that second body has on, on our environment around us. Uh, but we're here today for the Ninian Stevens Law Program Oration from Australia's Chief Scientist, Dr. Cathy Foley. Um, so the Ninian Stevens Law Program is a program run out of the Menzies Foundation and every three years um, they uh, give a, a grant to uh, an institute with the uh, aim of improving education in, in global legal challenges around the world. It's named after Sir Ninian Stephen, who I think most of you will know, but he is a University of Melbourne uh, law graduate. Um, and he's a very, very high, he was a very highly respected judge in the Supreme Court of Victoria, and also in a justice in the High Court of Australia. And he was governor, uh, Gen governor general of Australia for several years in the 1980s. And he's a very well respected man and people who were luck fortunate enough to meet him personally, talk a lot about his wit and his charm um, and he, that he was a very great company. And we're really proud that his legacy lives on here at the University of Melbourne with, as part of this Ninia Stevens Law Program. Uh, in 2021, Cade was fortunate enough to be the recipient of the Ninian Stevens Law Program um, grant from the Menzies Foundation. Um, as part of this program, uh, we'll be looking at ways to educate legal uh, lawyers on uh, how to respond to the ethical and legal challenges that come from emerging technologies. And we're looking at how we can educate and train lawyers such that they're able to, to respond to and give good ethical and, good ethical and legal advice uh, around technologies that might not even exist yet. And this program is very exciting and it's, it's just starting out. But as part of the program, as well as a body of research and a body of education, um, we also have an annual oration. And we're delighted this year, uh, in our first year, to have uh, Dr. Foley here to, to uh, present. And she'll talk uh, uh, something that's very on topic for Kate around the risk and opportunities that uh, emerging digital technologies have. And we'll be introduced, uh, we'll be introducing her a little bit later. Um, for now, though, what I want to hand over to um, my colleague, Professor Uwe Aiklin, who's the head of school in the School of Computing and Information Systems. And he's going to talk about the place where, unfortunately, we're not tonight, which is Melbourne Connect, which is the new building we've just moved into where we were hoping to host this event. And Uwe's going to give a bit of an overview of the building and its history. Thanks, Uwe. Oh, thank you very much, Tim. Um, so hello, everybody. I'm Professor Uwe Ekelin. Uh, I'm, as Tim was saying, the head of School of Computing and Information Systems, and I'm really happy to be here with you all tonight. I have a bit of an amateur interest in AI myself, but yes, I guess that's not why I'm here. Um, I'm here because um, Kate, the center that is hosting all of this, is uh, a center that is between the Faculty of Engineering and IT and the Faculty of Law, and we were very lucky to have the center located with us here in Melbourne Connect. And what you can see behind me is one of the many beautiful uh, vistas we have in Melbourne Connect. If you haven't already visited us, uh, you should do so as soon as you can. It is a really beautiful building on from the corner of Swanston and Grattan Street. Now, Melbourne Connect is more than a building. It's actually a whole precinct that uh, is a huge investment by the university, actually. 
and I'm very pleased uh, to be in it. In it is not just uh, our School of Computing and Information Systems, which includes uh, the center of Kate, but there's also uh, people from across the Faculty of Engineering and IT. So we have mechanical engineers, uh, we have some infrastructure engineers, uh, we also have some electrical engineers. And generally, it is all the people that work with digital and data. That is sort of one of the main focuses of Melbourne Connect. But I guess what makes Melbourne Connect uh, special um, is, as I said, as it's a precinct, is that it's uh, much more than just a university building. It is uh, also housing uh, companies and collaborators. It's housing uh, spin-outs and uh, uh, accelerators. But perhaps best of all, it is open to the public like no other university building perhaps. Uh, we have uh, within the precinct the, the science gallery, uh, which is a fantastic place to visit. And uh, we also have uh, the Telstra Creator Space, which is a venue where people can really learn how to engage with technology. I'm really chuffed to be here. And um, I hope that uh, in the near future, you can visit us. And I'd be very pleased to show you around myself or you, you know, introduce you to some of our colleagues. And uh, that's perhaps all I wanted to say about our, our building and our beautiful precinct. And uh, without further ado, then I shall move over to Professor Duncan Muskell, who is the Vice Chancellor of our university, and we'll have a few words for you as well. Okay, uh, thank you, Ed. I commence by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we work and learn, and I pay my respects to Indigenous elders, past, present and emerging, and I acknowledge all Indigenous people participating in this event. It's a real pleasure for me to participate tonight uh, for two reasons. The first is that it gives me the chance to give a warm welcome on behalf of the university to a number of very important guests, including Liz Gillies, CEO of the Menzies Foundation. And I particularly want to thank the Menzies Foundation for their support of this project, uh, the Ninian and Stephen Law Program. I also extend a warm welcome to our speakers this evening, Michelle Price, CEO of OSCYBER, and Dr. Cathy Foley, the Chief Scientist of Australia. Along with those welcomes, I want to acknowledge the late Sir Ninian Stephen, whose philanthropic generosity and vision underpins the extraordinarily important program of which tonight, tonight's oration forms a part. This leads to the second reason why I'm delighted to be associated with this evening's event, namely that the Ninian Stephen Law Program, New Legal Thinking for Emerging Technologies, really is a very important initiative. The program is a four-year initiative that brings together people from the Melbourne Law School, and the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology under the Centre for AI and Digital Ethics. The program is an inspiring example of the potential we have in this university for bringing together brilliant people from a number of discipline backgrounds and knowledge areas to work collaboratively in thinking together and in tackling with purpose some of the thorniest challenges that face us in the world today. As such, this program exemplifies the sort of cross-disciplinary approach to thinking about and solving problems uh, all the problems that the world faces in many different areas now. This approach, I think, is the far and away the best way to, to, to tackle the, the big questions and the big problems that we have. And, and few areas are probably more important than the need to think through systematically and creatively about the legal and other challenges associated with AI and with emerging technologies. We, of course, live in a time of rapid socio-technical change with new technologies embedded in our lives and communities in previously unimagined ways. And there's a corresponding need for our institutional frameworks, including law, to adapt, not just rapidly, but very appropriately and well uh, as well. To lead us in thinking about some of these questions tonight, it really is a great pleasure to turn now to our first speaker, Dr. Cathy Foley. Dr. Foley commenced as Australia's ninth chief scientist in January 2021. She was appointed to the role after a lengthy career at Australia's National Science Agency, the CSIRO serving as CSIRO's chief scientist from August 2018. Dr. Foley is a physicist with an extraordinarily successful research background of her own in a number of areas which have had enormous impact in an applied uh, way. In a wider sense, Dr. Foley is respected not only for scientific excellence, but for her leadership and science communication expertise, all of which make her eminently qualified for the key role of chief scientist of Australia, in which she is called on to provide independent advice to the prime minister the Minister for Science and other areas of government in areas including education, research and innovation. It really is a great pleasure to welcome her to be part of tonight's important event and to deliver the Ninian Stephen Law Programme oration. So thank you very much and over to you, Chief Scientist. 
Well, thank you so much, Vice Chancellor, and hello, everyone. It's such a great honour to be giving this oration tonight. First, I too would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the lands of the Camaragal people up in the northern suburb of Sydney near the Karingai National Park. And I want to pay my respects to them and to the traditional custodians of other lands where you're all based tonight. And I acknowledge the elders who are caring for those lands, but I also pay my respects to the old ones who've come before and the young ones who will follow. I understand that I was going to be speaking to you back in April. <laughs> My gosh, so much has transpired since then. No matter where we are, it's a very worrying time for so many people, especially those of you with vulnerable family and friends. I know I have spent many, and I'll say many weeks in lockdown at my home in Sydney, working remotely with my team who are in Canberra. And I know how difficult it is. It's come to feel a bit surreal for me, I must say, uh, here at, at my desk at home. I'm sorry I'm not with you in person, but I'm pleased you've been able to go ahead online. And let me start by saying that I wholeheartedly endorse your cross-disciplinary focus what really is an urgent issue. It's no secret that I'm a great advocate for the development of digital technologies. Just look at the role artificial intelligence has played in the code of response. AI helped sound the international warning bell at the start of the pandemic and has helped track its spread and forecast the development of mutating strains. AI, played an important role in finding and testing vaccines and therapy, which made the process much faster. AI has massive potential across the medical field. It also has potential in many other aspects of our lives, from planning and managing our cities, to automation in transport, to wrangling huge data sets that are beyond the capacity of individual scientists. It's not just, you know, hey Siri, please send a text to my husband. I'm here to talk about some of the challenges that AI presents. But before I do, I want to touch on a new set of digital technologies that are stampeding over the horizon. That is quantum technologies. And as Australia's chief scientist, I've made this a top priority. It's a really exciting avenue of research and innovation. And Australia has enormous potential. In quantum computing, we have some of the world's top developers and researchers. Quantum computing is every bit as peculiar as you will have heard. It's also every bit as powerful because it allows us to simulate the world at the tiniest scales. It will be nothing short of a game changer in medicine and many other fields. Quantum computers will be able to build completely new molecules then test and simulate their effects in the virtual realm. This means new therapies. It means new materials, new catalysts, for example, to split water more efficiently to release hydrogen, which is a bit of a holy grail in the shift to a low emissions economy. It means the ability to simulate systems far too complex for conventional computing, such as climate systems. Quantum technologies are not limited to computing. Quantum sensing and imaging also opens up exciting opportunities. Quantum sensing will transform our ability to map the earth beneath our feet and the oceans, which are largely invisible to conventional mapping techniques. It doesn't take a huge leap of imagination to see how important that is for Australia. In my role as chief scientist, I'm taking every opportunity to urge Australian policymakers, educators, and industry leaders to embrace the new digital revolution and stay with the leading pack. However, as you are aware, you don't need to look far for tripwires. I'm very conscious of the risks and the points of vulnerability. It's important that, as a nation, we're clear about these. I'm sure each of you has a phone within your reach right now. I certainly do. And I'm most sure that most of them are loaded with apps. Well, my family all uses Find My Friends. It's a location app and it's a good safety tool. I use it to check up on my adult kids. When I look now, they're mostly at home like all of us. 
But when we were allowed to run more widely, I'd see my son was walking along the Corso in Manly. And my daughter was somewhere where I wasn't quite expecting. And I'd be thinking, why aren't you at work? They know I do it. But to be honest, I feel a bit conflicted. It's just too easy to click and check. My husband uses a fitness app to record his runs. Fitness apps are likely to become more useful for monitoring our health. This information I'd be happy for my phone to share with my doctor, but I'd be appalled if it became available to my insurer or if an employer used the data to make judgments about my fitness or my eating habits. Sometimes this feels like I'm beginning to go and have an electronic version of going through my neighbor's rubbish bin. We're playing catch up with these technologies. New tech has this dual personality. It arrives so fast. I always find it hard to believe that the iPhone is only 10 years old. Can you believe it? At the same time, it also can creep up on us. We get excited by what seems like a fun new app, a device or a platform, but we fail to take that leap to imagine how else could it be used? Or what might it become? When it comes to social media, we're seeing the result in online bullying, fake news and issues with elect election integrity, problems with ownership of data and privacy. We didn't get the checks and balances right in the first place. All around us, there is amplification of disinformation and conspiracy. Where we once might have been able to shake our heads and ignore a crazy idea, those crazy ideas now move more quickly and grow more quickly than our power to combat them. This isn't just a great mass of misinformation that exists in the electronic world, a pile of unfiltered rubbish in someone's virtual backyard, this impacts the real world. I read an article recently, I think it was last week, where a Sydney GP, exhausted by trying to counter misinformation and conspiracy theories with evidence and argument, it doesn't work when people are used to having their views reinforced and strengthened the more they express them online. So social media and the current generation of mobile applications has given us a taste of the dangers. But the new digital technologies, AI, machine learning and quantum will amplify the risks. Now, I don't wanna give the impression that I view it all as risk and no reward. As I said at the outset, I am an advocate of digital technologies, including AI. And it is clear that models are enormously useful tools. Modeling has been so powerful in the pandemic. But when AI is used to model and predict our behavior, and then is used to make decisions about the way we are treated, whether that be employment decisions or banking decisions or other areas of our lives, we need to tread carefully indeed. I'm frankly horrified when I see AI being used to interview job candidates, not sort applications, but actually conduct the interviews. I see this as yet another avenue for uneven treatment of different groups in our society. In hiring, it's the bulk of the lower skilled jobs where decisions will be made by AI. The well off and the well connected aren't employed by algorithms because personal contacts are the currency of the rich. It should not be the case that an artificial intelligence program conducts job interviews. From where I stand, that's an easy judgment to make. But not all of our decision making is that clear cut. Consider the use of AI to, that might be um, used where we can track people who may reoffend in domestic violence situations. I read a study recently suggesting machine learning might be superior to human predictions in this field. For police, it allows them to be proactive and engage early in situations of potential domestic violence. But of course, the dangers are obvious and I don't need spelling out. Attention to bias in online profiling and deep learning is critical if we are to have the social license to use this kind of technology. It's not immediately clear to me 
whether the problems can be satisfactorily resolved. This use of AI. I mentioned this example, not because I have a firm advice on the particular question. I mention it because it focuses the mind quite sharply on those questions of risk and reward. As I said, models can be useful, but as we know, any model is only as good as the information fed into it. The data used in AI algorithms is incomplete. It's based on the way things have been, not necessarily the way they are or will be. It's based on limited numbers, approximations. The Human Rights Commission has considered how bias in algorithms can arise in the commercial world, where AI systems use incomplete and historical databases for modeling the credit worthiness of customers. Unsurprisingly, women, Indigenous people, and young people are most likely to bear the brunt of the built-in biases. It's imperative that those approximations and historical patterns don't, be, don't come to define the way we live our lives. We've heard a lot about the right to be forgotten. I also want our digital system to respect my right to be me, actual, unique me, not an approximation of me filled with assumptions, not the average or most likely version of me. Now, this is really tricky. The issues and solutions are no means simple. They will be most effective if they are framed within a clear set of principles, such as those set out by the government's AI ethics framework. There are three that I want to bring to your attention tonight. I've already mentioned my right to be me. That is my first principle. The first step achieving it is ensuring that our digital workforce is diverse in culture, sex, gender, age, and life experiences. I'll mention two more principles. One, transparency in algorithms and data that underpins AI in situations which it is deployed in. The second is accountability. This is especially difficult in the case of deep learning where we don't even have visibility of the way algorithms are working or the data they are bringing to bear on the question. At this level, uh, the AI system is creating its own model by harvesting information widely and then using a process of simplification and grouping to reduce the data points. This work going on under the surface is not easily discoverable, which makes it all the more difficult to control. So the mechanisms of accountability are not straightforward, but I'm keen to hear more about the possibilities for auditing of algorithms and public disclosure of their assumptions. If we get transparency and accountability right, and improve diversity in the sector, we will bring and make more important steps towards removing unfairness and bias, ensuring we don't get how taking over the cockpit. Of course, it is one thing to set up a set of principles. It's quite another to develop guidelines and tools to put them into effect. This is the next frontier. There are many other complex issues cultural differences in ethical decision-making, ownership of AI-invented systems or AI-conducted research. Who does own the intellectual property? What about artificial intelligence that creates its own AI? This was a question I think Star Trek tackled 30 years ago, futuristic and perhaps also personal. Now, when I talk about the challenges, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. What I can tell you is that the conversation is well and truly underway at multiple levels. And I'm pleased to see the momentum here and overseas. The Australian government recognises that the digital economy is the key to securing our economic future and has released a digital economy strategy. A national AI centre is being established to coordinate expertise and address barriers. The government has released an AI action plan supported by the AI ethics framework. It will help guide businesses and governments to responsibly design, develop and implement artificial intelligence. The Australian Human Rights Commission's recent report offers a number of recommendations for consideration, 
including an establish an establishing an AI safety commissioner to provide technical expertise and build public trust in the safe use of AI. I would like to congratulate the Centre of Artificial Intelligence and Digital Ethics on your focus on the challenges for emerging technologies and the launch of this program. Your input will play an important role. I'm excited by the systems thinking and the collaboration between the technical, legal and social spheres, which is exactly what we need as we tackle these really complex issues. I hope this program will inspire and convene more important, inclusive conversation to help our law and policy makers and our community more widely understand AI to a sophisticated level. I'm pleased to have taken the opportunity to consider some of these issues afresh as I prepared to speak with you today. And I hope that all of the initiatives, including yours, will come together for a robust approach. And as many of you noted, engagement, consultation, and ongoing communication with the public about AI will be essential for building community awareness. Public trust is critical to enhance acceptance and uptake of the technology. Now you might remember I told you about checking my children's whereabouts on our family location app. I don't want to leave you with the wrong impression. I'm not a stalker, really. It's not actually about checking up on them. They're not teenagers anymore. It's really about feeling connected with them. When they've left home, the family home, you can't rely on the dinner table anymore to catch up with what everyone's been doing. But I only told you part of the story. I probably should also mention that only four of my six children agreed to share their location information. Two actually rejected my request, such as a lot of your parents. But seriously, I'm pleased they're taking control of their privacy online. This is something we all need to do not only as individuals, but as a society. It's not about turning our back on digital technologies. It's about embracing them and engaging with them in a really active and sophisticated way. Expecting transparency, understanding the issue, having the conversation and taking charge of the solutions. Doing those things that your centre has dedicated itself to. So once again, congratulations. I wish you all the best in your work and thanks so much for having me here tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Foley, for that uh, wonderfully insightful talk and for the, for, for the lovely words that you've said about um, Cade. Uh, and, and a special thanks from me for giving me the title of my next grant, My Right to Be Me, which I think I'm going to take and I'll acknowledge you in the credits. Um, but that's really that insightful point of, of uh, the ability, the, the desire and the ability to be treated as, as myself rather than as, as an instance of a stereotype that somebody has ranged out is a really important um, problem. Yeah. Um, so um, next, we're, I'm going to invite Michelle Price, who's the CEO of um, OTS Cyber, which is um, the Australian Cybersecurity Growth Network. Um, and she's going to uh, deliver a reflection on Dr. Foley's uh, talk just now. So OSCIVER is, uh, as I said, the Australian Cybersecurity Growth Network, and it aims to support research, development, and education of cybersecurity in Australia and promotion of cybersecurity, um, Australian cybersecurity to the rest of, of the world. So, uh, Michelle, I invite you to give your reflection. All right. Thanks, Tim. Um, and thanks, uh, Chief Scientist. And uh, I too wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, and I'm coming to you from the, Ngun the, the place of the Ngunnawal people. Uh, so for most of you, you should actually know where that is because the Ngunnawal people get a very, very special place in acknowledgements to country. Ngunnawal uh, country is actually in the place of Canberra. And so, of course, they would tell you that it's Canberra that I'm joining you from tonight. Uh, and so the Ngunnawal people are very, very proud uh, to be a part of what makes Canberra so important in, in our landscape. Uh, and of course, I do have their permission to be able to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of country in cyberspace 
as well, which is incredibly important as we acknowledge uh, the all of the different types of disciplines, thinking, diversity that we need to be able to tackle the very challenges that Dr. Foley spoke of. Uh, so I, I do want to reflect tonight um, on a couple of different things that Dr. Foley's picked up on. And, you know, I think in, in the first instance, I do want to also acknowledge the incredible collaboration. Uh, it's very, very special to me uh, between uh, the University of Melbourne through Kate and Menzies Foundation. I'm a very long standing supporter and very strong supporter of Menzies Foundation in their very important work to provide the right kind of funding at the right time for the right things that we need to focus on when it comes to the engagement of our society with uh, the deep issues around law and ethics, particularly, of course, now with technology. And it's a really tricky area to tackle. As Dr. Foley pointed out, the complexity that we are now dealing with uh, across all of these spaces is to a lot of people quite frightening. Uh, and of course, that's part of what our roles are across the, the centre and well beyond is making sure that we actually make these conversations a lot more accessible for everyone to be a part of. Uh, the right to be me, the right to be forgotten, all of those things, that's quite individual. But of course, collectively, uh, we need those kinds of conversations and those deliberate actions to do the very thing that my job is all about doing, which is contributing to improving the safety and security around what we're doing in terms of now a very, very cyber physical world that we've created for ourselves. Uh, so I guess the first point of reflection uh, to pick up on one of the key points that Dr. Foley made is around the fact that at the moment, we are making, whether it's a conscious or subconscious choice, we're making that choice though still to own our intuition. Intuition still being the number one thing that AI has not been able to accurately replicate. And I think we absolutely do need to be mindful of the fact that we probably for a long time yet don't want to hand over the keys to that kingdom. In several of the examples that Dr. Foley gave, it is that intuition that has actually saved us and saved us in such important ways. That intuition that does help every day save the lives of the women, the women and children who are victims of domestic violence. The ways in which we can call out and listen to our intuition around fake news and disinformation that happens through social media. And of course, the ways in which we can now be celebrated and rewarded for thinking about whether or not that thing that's just happened to our laptop or our computer was, was it a glitch? Am I going to report it? Am I going to bother to report it? Am I going to care that actually it might not have been a glitch? It might be a malicious actor using my device to be able to get access to whether the keys are my kingdom as an individual for my family and my friends or that of my employer. And a lot of our cases uh, in Australia where over you know, now 90% of the businesses that are registered within this economy are small and micro businesses. The keys to two of those kingdoms are very, very short and closely located together. So it matters a huge amount that we do care about these issues. I think too, the, the great call out on quantum. For the audience, if you're not already aware, Australia has been absolutely so critical in the whole world of quantum technologies. And of course, we are living with quantum technologies right now. One of the key technologies that exists and uh, very proudly stands in the portfolio of technologies that I help to propel forward uh, is quantum encryption. And most of what you are now doing with your online banking, whether again, it's for personal or for professional reasons, uh, is actually supported by quantum encryption. Uh, now encryption, of course, has featured large in the news over the past couple of years. Uh, but suffice to say, a lot of the encryption that we're now seeing actually is using quantum technologies. Colleagues, quantum encryption was invented in Australia. That is a true story. It was invented on the campus of the Australian National University. And as a byproduct of that invention, random number generation was also invented. Random number generation is now the back end of the entire globe's financial system. These are things that we can stand proud about. The flip side, of course, though, is that, of course, for all of the great purposes that come from that, as again, that reflection that I'll make on Dr. Foley's uh, comments, is that for every great purpose, there are a multitude of bad purposes. And of course, this is the very job of cybersecurity to make sure that we are thinking through when we do invent or we innovate 
we're thinking about how we can do that with safety and security built in, like absolutely baked in from the very beginning. And how we do that, of course, is about the human engagement in that process of invention and innovation. The more that we can think about secure by design and therefore safety by design, and if we're doing those things, it's also privacy by design, the more we will be able to focus our efforts around the truly sophisticated uh, malicious activities that happen and get rid of all of this low-lying stuff that happens every day that really does mess with the livelihoods of everyday Australians and, of course, every human across the world. And increasingly, of course, when we look at the sophistication of the technologies that we're dealing with, uh, unfortunately, we're also looking at a situation where that sophistication is outpacing even some of the early technologies. Uh, and so why is it that we are not keeping pace? There is that sense that we're losing this thing and this thing is, is really feeling like it's a race. We're losing this race at the moment from a knowledge point of view because of course our learning methods have not kept pace with the nature and complexity of the technologies. And what all of us do know, and we're, we're seeing every day, including with the opening artwork, which I loved, that was so fantastic. Thank you to the artists who brought that to us. Uh, I think what we're seeing is that the complexity and the awesomeness in that complexity that we're generating every day with our prowess in technology, when we go to apply those technologies in real life, the methods that we're doing that with have become so convenient that we're losing the ability to actually learn how it works and why it's important to know how it works. Now that's not brand new information, all of us do know that, but we really have to tackle this particular challenge probably in a way that we really haven't needed to much before now, because if we don't tackle that challenge, then of course, as Dr. Foley said, we're going to actually lose out on a lot of the benefits that things like advanced machine learning, artificial intelligence and quantum can provide us as we really then tackle the one true thing that I think technology is going to really struggle with solving. It doesn't matter what your political persuasion is, the reality is all there and that's called climate change. So <laughs> mother nature, she smacks hard and uh, we know that we're going to have to really get on top of our game as humans on this planet uh, to make sure that we can continue to sustain ourselves. So for all of those grand things that we see coming down the pipeline with the intersection of things like quantum and AI, think about that, the intersection of those two things happening at the same time, put an environment around that, whether that's in government or it's in industry or it's in academia, then actually let's talk about the physicality. If we do that in space on micro satellites, it's super cool stuff. It's not science fiction. It is happening today, but we really have to be very mindful about the decisions that we're making, which of course is where the very important work of the law comes into it. We don't want to stifle innovation. We of course don't want to stifle invention. Invention is what's given us our world today, but we do need to be making sure that we know what the left and right of ARC is. And I'll finish up on just saying, Tim, that uh, you know I think it's interesting that the world has sort of thought a little bit about whether or not some of the big tech companies in the world have gotten too big, too big for their boots. Is it ethical around what they've been doing? I do think it's quite cute in many ways that we now get to think about what the legalities are and the ethics of Facebook turning up for the stock New York Stock Exchange this week and saying that they're going to change their name. I don't think the smell of the rose is going to change if we see a change in the name of Facebook for all of the ethical and legal issues that they've brought up for us. But I'm grateful that we've had those issues raised now while we're seeing the advent of AI be democratised at the same time as a whole range of other really important critical technologies being democratised as well. So I might finish my remarks there. It's been super, super honourable to be part of it today. And um, Let's see the centre absolutely thrive. The nation needs it and the world needs it. And I can't wait for us to be able to make it so accessible for everybody, including those that aren't particularly interested because they need to be. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle, for your wise words and on point um, uh, observations. That was, that was um, 
well um, appreciated by us. And I have to say that our secret aim is that every student should have an education in AI and cyber moving forward. Um, we've heard about having um, politics, philosophy and economics as a key policy degree. We would like to have um, engineering policy and law. Watch this space. Um, so thank you again. Um, the link between cyber and AI in the Ninian Stevens Law Program is very deliberate, um, as I think Michelle and Kathy have both illustrated. The two are intimately linked, and the success of the potential of new emerging digital technologies is very linked to our capacity to control and contain the risks. Both of these elements, cyber and AI, are part of the Ninian Stevens Law Program. Um, new legal thinking for emerging technologies. And I would like to acknowledge here the role of my colleagues um, in the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology, Atif Ahmed and Lars Kulik, who will be leading the cyber side of this project. Um, it is also my great delight just to note that the lovely artwork brought to you today is part of another CAID project, which is CAID Aid, um, AI and Art, um, and I would also like to thank our artists for participating. And one of our goals is to use the power of art um, to raise awareness of the issues and challenges of AI and other technologies in society. Um, so on behalf of um, CAID and the Union Stevens Law Program, I'd like to thank both of you for your time and insights. Um, we do have some time remaining and I do understand that you are willing to take some questions. So at this point, I'd love to be able to turn it over to the audience, if I may. Um, and the first question comes from, um, which is kind of a comment as well as a question. Um, he comes from Roger Woodward, who says, who makes the observation, um, I think, that um, uh, physical, physical health data is really important in the development of AI and gives the example of um, monitoring the health status of volunteer firefighters, noting that more deaths from heart attacks than any other traumatic event on the fire ground um, are responsible for more other um, the deaths on the fire ground and notes that, you know, surely this is the tide of field that AI has potential. Um, do we have, uh, it's almost a comment, but would, would either of you like to um, make an insight or, or comment on medical AI, which is, I think, equally um, at the forefront and exciting. Kathy. Yeah, look, um, thanks. Uh, it's, it's, it is really important uh, that we see where we can use uh, the ability to, it's, it's not just AI, but it's also the sensing side of things uh, and the way we can have smart clothing, we can have wearable sensors, we can have implanted sensors. And, you know, those are the, the I don't, the people who have uh, pacemakers, for example, have got those pacemakers which are embedded in their hearts to make them work and they'll get a phone call from the doctor to say come into the hospital because something's come up on your pacemaker record and our flags come up and we'll come and uh, and you get an adjustment done because it's been able to pick that up and that happens now I in fact had someone calling in saying medical emergency we'll be late for meeting and then turned up fine and they, they explained that that is exactly what happened one of the things we have to deal with, though, with um, firefighting is, and this is something that comes in with all these sorts of things, is uh, it's easy to think about embedding some device into our heart and knowing that if you don't, we'll die. But there's, there's also this thing of like firefighting. There's a whole cultural aspect to it, and it's not just in this particular area, but it, every, every subculture will have things where there's been tradition, there's been uh, a way of doing things, which means that bringing in new digital technologies will possibly seem like um, something which is breaking into something deeply important to them. And I think that's gonna be the biggest issue is um, that recognition of how you can bring technology into cultures and, and also into, um, into um, the way people have done things for a long time and show the benefit. And we've seen that to some extent, even with the rollout of the um, COVID vaccine, where there was a huge amount of hesitancy. And then I don't know what happened to bingo. Suddenly we're, you know, gone from being behind the pack to being in front of the pack of, um, of countries being vaccinated. 
but then you'll see pockets of, of people not wanting to be vaccinated for a range of reasons and it's always because of the culture coming in. So when we go back to the question at hand about um, you know, coming in and showing how we can show value, I don't know what it is, but we are, as a human race, I think, quite comfortable with the way things always have been and uncomfortable with making changes, even when there's evidence that it, um, it may be good for us. And that's where the social sciences and the multidisciplinary aspect of things are so critical. Thank you. And um, I just, um, you know, agree with that, uh, that argument about um, collaborative design. And I know this is very much part of Tim Miller's work, which is the human in human computer interactions. Um, Jessica um, has a question which is relevant, which is, um, thank you for the speech, says Jessica. Do you think there is a problem, prom prominent role for lawyers in tackling these upcoming issues? Um, and in, if so, um, what skills or expertise should lawyers be um, developing? Now, Jessica, that is actually our project, but it would be interesting to see what Dr. I Foley agree thinks. completely. In fact, um, one of my mantras has been that, uh, well, when I was working in CSRO and, you know, there's always the inevitable uh, resizing or budget cuts or things where you have to reorganise things. And, uh, and whenever that happens, we say, you've got to save the science. And I'm sort of saying, well, actually, it's science on its own is not very helpful. It's uh, it's actually just information. In order, in order for things to have an impact, you've got to have what I call science plus. So you've got to have an engineered outcome from that. So you have to turn it into an engineered something. And it doesn't matter whether it's a social science or a um, something which is for public good. It's um, still need to have some engineering um, to get it there. Then you need to have the social license that we, we're agreeing to that. You need to have the laws and the regulations. You need to have business models because it doesn't matter, even public good thing, all need to have some way of someone paying for it. And one of the things which I think we can see in Australia has been when we've brought all that together, we've had amazing impact. But too often we've got these different silos, which means that we feel that they're treading on other people's grounds. They don't necessarily realize that they've got to bring in all these multidisciplinary approaches to make the magic happen. And, um, and so the answer is yes, it's absolutely critical. And what skills are needed? I think this is where, I, I, it's great to hear the idea of having, um, you know, um, the much more multidisciplinary aspects of our training or our development. I know, uh, you know, I did a physics degree at university, but I also did a diploma in education and although I never went on to teach, that diploma of education, I think, gave me an extraordinary exposure to the social sciences and education and learning, which has given me a huge boost in other areas. And I, and I, I know when I've done any personal development training, it's not knowing any more physics. It's actually, although sometimes I have to learn some new techniques, and that's part of that, you know, credentialing and, and making sure we're on top of our game. But the things that have made a difference to me has always been the extras, which are all to do with um, learning about um, the, the techniques that add to which are outside my field. And then also knowing when to go and where to go to get expertise beyond what I could ever do so that they, I can partner with them. So I think that's gonna be the same in all areas. It's not just law, it's gonna be marketing, it's going to be in uh, social sciences, in arts. And one of the things I forgot in my research class is that human interface where we need the art, um, the, the um, user, user experience is absolutely critical to get that acceptance. And so you've got to you know, pull, pull the whole team together and, and learn and, and respect what everyone brings to the table. Thanks. Um, I'll move on because there's so many questions, but um, Michelle, this is a question from you, um, which is um, from Sammy, who also happens to be on the CAID advisory board. Um, and Sammy asks, a number of industries such as medicine, nuclear power, aviation are highly regulated industries. Some argue this slows down innovation, which it does, but the regulation is largely there because the cost of getting it wrong in these domains is too high. At what point does the cost of getting cybersecurity, IoT and so on become too high to get it wrong? Or um, is it there already um, and we're moving towards semi-blindly at high risk? Hopefully not semi-blindly, but <laughs> I think you get the question. 
Absolutely. Well, thanks, Sammy. Awesome question. And, you know, this is actually probably one of the pieces of misinformation that's rolling around, um, around how much it does cost to do cybersecurity well. One of my key messages that I give all the time, particularly in business, is cybersecurity is an investment. We cannot see it as a cost because the cost that is incurred for getting it wrong on cybersecurity is absolutely going up higher and higher and higher. Whereas there is um, a sort of a unit economics kind of piece around uh, when you do the investment well and you do sustain that investment as opposed to maintain the investment. So in other words, you're being adaptive to your environment uh, and your, your business strategy. Um, and, you know, by the way, um, universities and government agencies have business strategies just as much as uh, the private sectors do. Uh, so, you know, I think that we do need to look at it through the lens of investment as opposed to cost. But in terms of those highly regulated industries that were mentioned, um, you know, my view is, um, and maybe it's a little bit unconventional, but my view is that we've got to accept that it's a good thing in terms of lives saved versus lives, lives lost to have those regulations there. And, and I think that's what you're kind of drawing out there. Uh, but we need to, by accepting that those regulations need to be there, work within them. And once we actually accept that those, uh, those boundaries are there, uh, certainly when we look at nuclear technologies as an example, the amount of innovation that can happen is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. We've just got to give ourselves permission to explore. And this is where I think the UK has done a really great job of setting up what we refer to in Australia, I guess, colloquially as uh, regulatory sandboxes, where you create a safe environment for experimentation the government is in the room to observe and learn, which actually also helps with trust between researchers, industry and government uh, to be able to see what would happen. Uh, but at the same time, be able to absolute, like to celebrate up the wazoo when something does evolve out of that kind of sandbox environment that can be a game changer, even if that means that boundaries shift. But we do it in a transparent way. And I loved that Kathy picked up on that word transparency. Transparency absolutely is the fuel for curiosity in the most highly regulated environments as well as the most unregulated environments. Uh, so great question. I think that, I don't think that regulation has to stifle innovation. Where we do see it stifle innovation is where there is a lack of understanding of context. And that's my other key message I'd give you today. Cybersecurity is a game of context. And again, once we see that it's a game of context, because no two attacks are the same, no two operating environments are the same, no two set of kits is the same, all the rest of it, uh, that's when we really do see that actually it is an investment. It's not a cost to how we actually live our lives now. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, that was a comprehensive and uh, I think wise answer as always. Um, if I may, Kathy, may I would love to squeeze in one more question. Is that sure. possible? And I think there's some fabulous questions there, but I think the one that perhaps would be interesting to finish up from is from John, who says, um, it's great to hear a positive but cautious approach to AI and cyber. Thank you. Um, there's clearly a need to wrap a layer of governance around the use of AI in many cases. But as the number of algorithms and models grow, how do you see the governance model scaling without the necessary skilled resources to understand tech, legal and ethical aspects, is there a role for AI in AI governance? And I'd love to hear, I know we're running out of time, but I'd love to hear a few words from both of you, if I may, because I think that's a great question. It is a great question. And that's something which I think you're right. It's going to be something where this is a whole new way of thinking. And we need to be open to breaking the model the way we do things. Uh, I, the idea that um, we just build on the structures and the approaches that are of setting up governance of um, what's what we agree to as a community that's okay is is sort of our traditional way of doing things. But I I get a sense that we are looking at a major disruption that we have to be open to looking at um, what is it that we really need to set up and invest in so that we are sure that we've got the ability to use the good bits and govern, you know, have the governance and the management of the bits that could go pear shaped for us. And if you just think about the way social media has evolved over, you know, it's not been around, not been around that long, and yet it's got to a point where had 
had we actually um, thought about it before it just snuck up on us and sort of evolved and, and morphed into what we've got today. And we actually had thought through what the possibilities were and then set up a way of designing what are the frameworks we want to operate in, such as, I don't know about you, but you buy something on the internet and then it sends you constantly in advertisements for things that you don't want, but you can't sort of see what filters are being used. So why is it that we just don't have that, that you can, as a matter of, of human right, that you can get in there and change those filters? Or, uh, or that you can turn them on or off, or you can at least see what, what's being brought in front of you as a consequence of previous searches. Those, I mean, that's just one little thing, and I'm sure those who are, you know, this is their bread and butter, will have a much more sophisticated ways of it. But as you said, you know, we're getting to a point where uh, it's um, the volume and scale is the thing that often gets us. So that's where things digital actually do give you an advantage. So long as you know, sort of got that way of using it, but you've also got to have the governance of the um, on, on top of the things that are creating the governance. So it's it's actually, uh, I think, complex. And it's the first step is, as I mentioned, is talking about it, looking at what's possible and not getting stuck with this is the way we've always done things and having and creating limitations for ourselves. But Michelle might have a different view. Um, well, I think largely the same, um, although with a, a, probably a, a little bit of a nuance. I think that with the tech, again, we've got the choice um, around when we when we have uh, sort of democratized true AI, and this is where, of course, a lot of us who are in the game sort of labor over the fact that we don't actually have AI in its true definition in full use um, in, a, in a broad way at the moment. It's actually advanced machine learning, but this is great, right, because it means that as soon as we do have, um, you know, widely available uh, unit economics workout for us to be able to apply true AI in lots of different circumstances, we will we don't have to switch off advanced machine learning. <laughs> we can still choose to use AML along with AI. And I feel like AML is going to become the governance of AI. Uh, when we think about the different circumstances, particularly around um, you know, really, really sensitive activities, um, particularly when it comes to things like health uh, and, you know, really sensitive data, where we can actually have the intervention of a human applying that applied machine learning to make sure that, uh, you know, the AI doesn't get out of hand or out of control and do the sense checking on whether or not it starts to iterate on itself when we didn't expect it to. Uh, so I think there's some really interesting spaces that could emerge out of this. Um, but in any case, of course, the original foundations and formation of the AI still comes from us. So we still get to choose. Uh, so it's I, I'm Liz Gillies, uh, CEO of the Menzies Foundation, and it's my great delight to give a vote of thanks tonight. Um, the Menzies Foundation raises the profile and importance of outstanding leadership, and we do this by identifying leadership challenges and building really amazing collaborations to address those challenges. And Kate and tonight is a good illustration, I think, of the power of collaboration and multiple perspectives. One of the big insights the foundation's had about leadership over the last couple of years is this very significant shift from leader to leadership, which sounds like a simple thing, but actually is much more complex than that. The whole notion of leader, not a leader, not providing a solution, but this idea of teams and new forms of coalescence is undoubtedly one of the ways that the world's going to make sense of AI, ethics and cybersecurity and the numerous problems that we face. The sorts of qualities that we're seeing that are fundamental to future models of leadership are this notion of comforts and complexity, of multiple expertises, of boundary spanning, of operating outside of the silos. And I think both our speakers tonight, both Cathy and Michelle, have really um, articulated very clearly the absolute primacy of that in terms of how we think about how we go away and think as a community, as a society, in terms of our context as um, in the world, how we're going to grapple and tackle some of these challenges that we face. Uh, and so in terms of the vote of thanks, can I just say that Cade, I think, is a wonderful manifestation of all of those things. It brings together multiple expertises. It's future focused. It wants to answer these questions that, re that rely on new forms of collaboration, new forms of insight, 
new forms of how to frame and think about how together collectively we might bring all those multiple um, multiple expertises to solve some of the problems. And Kathy and Michelle, the way that you've articulated the context for the work, the perspectives that you've bring, I think demonstrate the great power of what CAID offers us in bringing together these sorts of conversations and framing the platforms from which we as a whole community can move forward. So on behalf of the Menzies Foundation, we're so delighted to be partnering with the University of Melbourne. We're so um, we're so proud in all that CAID exists in terms of multiple competencies. We're delighted that CAID have brought such eminent speakers, both Kathy and Michelle, to offer a really fabulous perspective. And the foundation very, very much looks forward to walking alongside CAID as it does extraordinary work um, over the next couple of years. So, Jeannie, thank you to the University of Melbourne. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Foley, for your very interesting insights. Thank you, Michelle. The Foundation loves working with you, Michelle, in all sorts of ways. And Jeannie and Tim, over to you for, as I said, a very bright and interesting future. I think I meant to say, oh, I meant to say good night, Jeannie. Do you want to say good night, Jeannie? <laughs> Uh, good night and thank you everybody for coming and I think there were so many questions that I'm looking forward to our next in-person event in Melbourne Connect. We'll see you there. Thank you. Good night.